Cassie, thank you so much for welcoming me to this community. I'm really excited to share my insights. So I hope that it can add value. And any questions along the way, please feel free to throw them in the chat and we will try and get those answered. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen. So can everybody see my presentation? Okay, perfect. So I want to talk to you a little bit about preparing for the wild today. Now, when I say wild, it's very much going into the job search, which at times can feel like the unknown. It can feel very uncomfortable. It can be quite an overwhelming process and actually quite emotionally exhausting. Um, believe me, I've, I've been in that situation. So I definitely understand a lot of the struggles. So hopefully today we're going to dive into how we can change our mindset around this, how we can get a bit more clarity on how we can stand out, how we can really make a difference and an impact and prepare for the wild. So a little bit about me. Um, my name's Ellie King and I'm the co-founder of Equal IT. So Equal IT is very much a mission-driven business and we work to diversify tech teams. We do this through refined talent acquisition and we really complement this with diversity and inclusion consulting. This is a topic that I am extremely passionate about just through my own personal experiences as well in, in growing up. And um, I'm really happy to be speaking to you today about how we can make a difference and an impact. I'm also the host of the Equal Inspired podcast. So this is an initiative to amplify the voices of women and diverse minorities who are doing amazing work in tech, in data, to really create relatable role models and to educate and empower and inspire. So if anybody watching wants to come on an episode of Equal Inspired and share your story, hit me up after the presentation. We'd love to hear from you and to be inspired by your own journey. So let's start with a little exercise that I think is really, really important. Now, this can be done before a job interview, when you're at a point in your career, maybe when you're feeling a little bit lost, when you're not necessarily sure what direction you want to go in, when you're transferring from academia to industry. And it's all about self-reflection. So this sometimes isn't the easiest of things to do. And I really am a big fan of Simon Sinek, Start With Why. And anyone who isn't familiar, I really recommend checking out some of his presentations. But it's really just getting to know your purpose and realigning with your personal mission statement. And what this is going to enable you to do is just really have clarity. Uh, this is going to help you create a really clear and concise CV. It's going to help you understand more about what it is you want from a business and actually what impact you can make when it comes to an organization. So understanding your why. So I would recommend blocking out 30 minutes, maybe an hour of your day to do this in a quiet space when you're not necessarily too stressed to really give yourself some thinking time and grab a paper and pen. This is really important that you actually take the time to write it down. I just think there's something a little bit more special about putting pen to paper than typing it up in front of you. So I want you to think about your strengths. When I say strengths, this is from a technical and a softer skills side. So the human element, and that's things like communication, team spirit, ambition, really thinking about the areas you feel you thrive in and you excel in. And when you have those, I want you to write down tangible examples or scenarios that you feel really back up your strengths. So thinking a little bit about what specifically have you done? What was the direct value and impact that this had maybe in your team, in your university class, on your friends, on your family? So really thinking about your strengths and the impact and writing that down. Next, it's thinking a little bit about growth. Now, when I say growth, this is more so areas to improve. So really actually reflect and think about what is it that you want to learn moving forward? So what, what do you actually want to achieve? So if you're going from academia to industry, 
what kind of things do you want to learn within that transition? And really dig deeper to understand why that is. Why do you want to learn this? So how will it benefit your career, number one? How do you think that that can add value to a potential company that you're going to be interviewing at as well? And just think about, are you already being proactive in learning this? If you are, fantastic. This is a great step. And please write down, again, an example of how you're doing that. Maybe you're doing Udemy, Coursera courses, doing some other trainings, attending events, conferences, or just reading lots of articles on it, which is great. If you're not trying to learn that already, think about how can you start? And maybe think about why you haven't already. What is it that's been holding you back? What are these factors? And again, write all of this down. So you're starting to formulate quite a long list of really great data that you can use to add value in your journey. Values, that's a really important one. Um, this is really understanding what's important to you. What are your non-negotiables when it comes to a business that you want to work at? So obviously we want to be in a team and a company whose values align with our own. So this is why it's really important to list your values. So you really get to know them, you understand them. And also it's really helpful for potentially going into interview scenarios. If you have a clear understanding of what your values are, you can ask a lot of questions based around that and it can help you uncover whether or not this company is going to be the right fit for you because yes we want to work on exciting projects we want to be challenged but we want to be in a business where we feel like we can belong and we feel like we're working towards a mission that relates to us and we get that engagement and this is what ties me on to the next point which is fulfillment because that's equally as important when you're starting a career, when you're changing a job. And I think that COVID has made a lot of people realize this as well. Actually, what's important to us? What do we want to get out of a career? It's enabled us to have that chance to reflect on these things. So this is thinking about what really gives you enjoyment in your work, in what you do, and remembering your why. So again, write down your motivations for why you actually entered technology, why you started working with data. What was it that inspired you to start this? Or who was it that inspired you to start this? What makes you most happy working in this space and why? And also, what do you dislike and why? And this part's really important because what it's going to help you do is formulate a great story for your cover letter, for your CV, to really get to know you as an individual. And also, you can use this in an interview scenario. It helps to answer that question, to so tell me about yourself, which isn't the easiest question in the world. You know, we know ourselves better than anyone out there. But when we're asked that, I've been there myself, my mind almost goes blank and I, I can't think of anything. So I don't know if anyone else can relate, but this will help you formulate a story as to why you are passionate about this, what you enjoy, what, what you love. So I really recommend writing these points down as well. And then finally, I mentioned ask. So you've had the chance to self-reflect. You've got a great list now of all of these things. Next, I want you to actually ask your friends, your family or your colleagues about each of these points as well. So what you're doing is you're formulating a great self-reflection of yourself, but then you're having that backed up by other people's opinions on you from what they've experienced with you. And it kind of reinforces that you're these great things because Again, sometimes our inner imposter likes to creep in. And when we think about self-reflection and, and speaking about our strengths, it can feel at times that maybe we don't want to seem like we're boasting or I don't want to seem um, that I'm kind of speaking out of line or, or I don't believe that I'm that. So actually just by asking those around you, it really helps to reinforce that. And they may give you some other areas that you didn't even think of yourself and that's really good again to um, use in an interview scenario 
you know, oh, I, uh, I've actually, for my strengths are being a great communicator. Funnily enough, one of my colleagues, they mentioned a time when I did X, Y, Z, and this had a really positive impact on them. And this led to X, Y, Z impact in our team. So again, it's just that clarity. It's just that structure. So we've had the time to self-reflect and now it's time to think a little bit about how can we stand out in what's a very crowded job market. We've all been there probably sending lots of applications and sometimes never hearing anything back. And it can be so frustrating, so demoralizing, but if we're doing everything we can to stand out, then what, what more can we do, right? So these are some good points that I wanna to talk to you about today. So Jeff Bezos does mention that your brand is what people say about you when you're not in the room. So working on your personal brand is something that is absolutely key, I feel, to help you stand out and to really complement your CV and your cover letter. So what this does is, of course, it attracts opportunity, right? So it gives you a lot of opportunity to be visible in your space. It enables you to have a lot of focus so you can become an expert in your specific field or the area that you're most passionate about and making sure that it's aligned to your own values. It enables you the chance to network as well, to, great, to create great connections, um, whether that be getting mentorship opportunities, whether it be actually being approached for jobs because you're becoming quite recognized in your space. And it enables you to build trust with your audience. And in turn, your confidence will flourish working on your personal brand. You'll become so much more self-aware, so much more energized in achieving your goals. And also it really helps, um, I would say, with your imposter syndrome that you may go through throughout your journey. Um, I know it has myself. I, I took the plunge to start working on my personal brand and really come out of my comfort zone. And it's, uh, I haven't looked back since. It's been a great experience. So I can highly recommend it from a personal standpoint. There are some commitments needed when it comes to working on your personal brand. Now, what I like to say is um, it's almost like being an octopus, having many different arms in many different areas. So you're always keeping busy. Uh, it's gonna take consistency, really being relentless with your personal brand. So finding your flow and keeping at it. So something that I recommend doing, um, starting small when it comes to your personal brand is maybe, um, for once a week, book an hour in your calendar where you are gonna focus purely on your personal brand. And once you've started getting familiar with that and you start seeing some successes, maybe look to build it up. Okay, can I find two hours during my week to work on my personal brand? But always have it in mind. And I would say as well, it's really important to be authentic. So this is why self-reflection was so important. Working on your personal brand, you want to be true to yourself. You want to, I guess, always self-reflect, always challenge yourself, challenge your ideas, be able to look in the mirror and think, okay, how can I continue to improve? And sometimes have those difficult conversations with yourself um, and with others and, and actually ask for feedback. Where do you think I can improve? How can I grow in this space? It's going to take confidence. So like I say, it really is at times coming out of the comfort zone, uh, believing in yourself and your abilities. You can do this. Um, and we'll talk about why you can do this a little bit later on. And again, just being resilient. I always say with your personal brand, it's about having the long game in mind, right? So you may not see successes. You may not see wins straight away. But if you keep being consistent and keep doing the right things, I can assure you that opportunities will come your way or great conversations, great opportunities to network. It really will. So when you feel disheartened that you're not seeing anything, just remember that it will be worth it in the long run and you'll definitely reap the rewards. So how can we work on our personal brand? I just wanna share a few examples of some of the things that I've seen work really well, particularly when it comes to companies and what they look for from individuals when they're hiring. 
So it's about finding your voice and being consistent. So building an online presence, right? We can look at creating content, for example. So a video series or a blog series. Now, again, video can be quite daunting. Um, it's really putting yourself out there. Believe you me, when I started making videos on my YouTube, I think I did about 100 takes for one video before I felt like I got it right. And even then I was still kind of second guessing myself, but just putting the things out there is so important. So if you wanna start small, I recommend maybe doing a blog series. So if you're in academia or if you're in industry, can you describe if you're learning something new? Can you do a blog series in this? Can you document that? Um, can you document if you've attended a course or a boot camp? How was your experience in this? What things did you learn? Have you done a recent project that you're quite passionate about and you can speak about? Can you share your lessons learned and your knowledge and your achievements? This is really important. So um, creating maybe some blog series or video series where you can openly speak about the things that you've actually done yourself. So if you're talking about an experience that you have, there's no right or wrong, right? And it's just putting yourself out there and starting small. Tech Twitter, I found to be a really great community if, if used in the right way. You can learn so much, you can make great connections, you can search hashtags for topics that you're really passionate about. And just think about engaging and replying in different tweets and then maybe start with your own content. Uh, join communities, which you're doing great by being at Our Ladies Cologne. Uh, that's a really important one and I've found a great way to build your presence because if you're attending different communities who are hosting different events, that also gives you a really great topic to maybe do a video on, or again, a blog series on, or a LinkedIn post, or whatever social media post you use. Can you share why you enjoy this community, how it's benefited you, events that you've attended there, um, anything that you feel you're passionate about. Podcasts as well. Um, I found that to be really a cool platform in order to get yourself out there so whether you have some friends who are working on their own podcasts um, maybe put yourself out there about coming uh, as a guest on on the podcast on a show or reaching out to podcasts that you love and you follow within the data space um, maybe seeing if you can help or you can do any volunteering work with them just anything you can do to be involved in these missions or can you create your own, right? It's definitely not the hardest thing in the world. If you have a mission, if you have a vision, and if you want any advice in how to set up your own podcast, again, please feel free to drop me a message. I'm very happy to talk you through that, uh, let you know the great platforms that you can use. Um, but yeah, can you look at doing a podcast? Again, it's just having the long game in mind. So when it comes to creating your content, I always think that you should be doing it for the right reasons. So knowing in the background, it's going to benefit you to stand out, uh, to help you in your job process, to enrich you as an individual and to help others, but being quite genuine with it. Um, I kind of take the approach, if I'm helping one person, then I'm doing okay. I'm doing my job. That's good enough for me. And I think that, that that's a good mindset that keeps you going. And it keeps you energized on this journey because it's definitely not the easiest thing in the world. It does take time. It does take you to commit to this. But like I say, it will be really worth it. And particularly for companies, it showcases to them that you have confidence, that you care about sharing knowledge. And it enables you to build a really strong portfolio to share with potential companies outside of just the CV and the cover letter. You can attach your YouTube channel, for example, check out all of the things I've been doing in this space. I'm really passionate about it. And I feel it can add value to your team because of X, Y, Z. So um, this is one thing I, I really recommend to build an online presence. Next, it's volunteering. So this enables you to get hands-on experience, which is great, to make an impact. And having that on your CV, it just, again, really highlights to companies your commitment to your values of helping people. It shows that you want to support, you want to inspire, you're willing to invest your own time to help others. And that's what companies 
care about, right? Because if you do that in your own time, of course, that's going to reflect how you could potentially be as an employee, right? So being involved in volunteering, again, networking opportunities, this is really important. So there's some amazing businesses out there, data-driven businesses, who actually um, support different communities and initiatives. So by being involved in them, it could give you the opportunity to build relationships with individuals working in these businesses and maybe get a heads up on job opportunities if they feel you could be a good fit if you've had a really good experience with volunteering. Um, maybe you could get the heads up before it's even gone out on a job advert or a LinkedIn post. So you could get your CV in front of the hiring managers first. So could really open up a lot of opportunity for you. And again, you're going to be learning throughout the process, being involved in nonprofits, hackathons. There's so many communities out there. And um, I know we all don't have all of the time in the world, but even if it's something you can commit to once a month, once every two months, it's still something that you're doing and being proactive with. And um, could you maybe set up your own nonprofit? Who knows, right? Uh, the possibilities are endless. Also upskilling and hobby projects. So this is really important, particularly if you're coming from academia and you're going into industry, because what I hear quite often is um, people being rejected because they don't have the industry experience. They don't have that production experience, right? So this is gonna be a good way to try and I guess, um, supplement that right it's going to be a good way to showcase that you you can do this and you're still doing it off your own back so of course personal benefit of working on hobby projects you enrich yourself you learn new things but what it enables you to do is again provide really tangible examples to include in your cv and this can make up for any gaps in, in the skills of requirements for a job to your CV. So this is really important. Also, again, it showcases your commitment, your passion. It really shows to your potential employer that you're willing to invest hours and go the extra mile. And this again is really important. And also it just enables you to I guess flourish in so many different ways. It could positively impact your salary because maybe you have really strong experience on the personal projects aspect in, in one area. Um, so that could influence that. But I also think it's important to, um, to be selective in the things that you're doing on, a, on your hobby project. So not to be diving into too many different areas where you're spreading yourself very thinly. I think if you have a focus and the roles that you wanna apply for have a similar focus, really hone in on that and try and make your learning and your experiences around that. Because again, it just really showcases to organizations that you know what your focus is, you know where you wanna be and you're doing everything you can to get there, even when you don't have that industry experience. And another one is um, events, meetups, conferences. Very exciting that we're now beginning to have face-to-face -face again, which is quite refreshing. So really take advantage of this. It's awesome to engage, to learn, and again, to network. You can exchange ideas. You can share some of the challenges that you're facing, maybe where coming from academia into industry and, and struggling with that transition or not having any luck, share those challenges with other people. Maybe you might uncover solutions. Um, so again, it can be quite overwhelming sometimes going to face-to-face -to -face events when there's lots of people in one room. So start small, take it virtual, which is what you're doing today, which is awesome. Um, but there's lots of opportunities to network in, in, in these sessions as well. And I've seen some really cool um, breakout rooms where you can network and cameras come up, microphones come on at these virtual conferences. So um, even if you wanted to have your camera off, you can just openly speak and, and take that first step. Also, going to these events and meetups, if, if you're having your focus, 
it enables you again to start becoming recognized to seeing familiar faces in your industry um, to getting to know what's going on in uh, terms of the trends of, of your industry and what you're working on um, so really staying on top of the latest trends and as well it enables you to gather content so like we said about doing posts and linkedin social medias videos attending all of these different events i always recommend like a summary of the event some of your top takeaways the things that you've learned and why you enjoyed it is a really good post and actually others can learn from that as well when i say your top three uh, what i mean by this is some of us have like the top three dream companies that we want to work at right that is just the, the key for us and sometimes these companies they can be hosting lots of events and meetups so it's a great opportunity for you to potentially visit their office in an event scenario see it for yourself kind of almost visualize yourself as an employee and network with people who are volunteering maybe from the business and mention that you're really excited about their mission and what they're doing because of this and maybe ask outright hey you know is there any opportunities or who, who's best to contact so um, that's really important for your top three networking and again this just builds your confidence it really does uh, I know it's not easy trust me uh, to, to kind of come out of that comfort zone to approach people but start small and just know that these things they will benefit you in the long run and I just want to share some advice actually from a good friend of mine who's a developer engagement lead and this is when it comes to events um, and, and to meetups, and it's to get involved in the community. So be proactive, look to volunteer at different events, build your network, your knowledge, and come out of your comfort zone. And connect with the speakers as well. Don't be scared. If you like their talks, go and tell them that. You know, Start a conversation and, and take it from there. Those influential people can later on connect you to other people and give you tips. You get to know people by talking, so don't be afraid. Even if you're at a face-to-face -face meetup and you don't have that confidence to maybe approach the speaker there and then, why don't you reach out to them on social media later that day and just say, hey, I, I loved your talk because of X, Y, Z, I'd love to connect and share ideas and, and take it from there. So there's always a solution. So we've worked on how we can stand out and some of the things we can do. I want to talk to you a little bit about job descriptions and I guess just demystify a few things because I think particularly as women um, we can be really hard on ourselves and like perfectionists and there is a statistic that uh, if we're not 100% match for a job application we won't apply for it whereas I believe I read that guys it's around 50 to 60%. Um, when I think about myself, I can really relate. Uh, there's been a few jobs that I've seen and I've been like, wow, I can't apply for that. Who do I think I am? Because I've been missing like one or two things. So I want to share with you a quote from a CTO. It's always nice to find someone with the perfect experience of our stack. But what's more important is a humble and curious mindset. So if you don't know something, are you the type of person who wants to learn? Are you working on personal projects? If so, that would also be interesting. So I guess what I'm trying to say is don't overstress about being perfectly qualified because realistically, does this person even exist, right? When companies put quite a big almost shopping list of requirements, don't be so hard on yourself. As long as you're gonna be tailoring and customizing, which we'll talk on in a moment, then you've done everything you can. So don't hold yourself back, go for it, believe in yourself. Here are some things to consider before you even send your application to a job. So first of all, <clears throat> really consider taking some time to research. Now, when I say that, it's really thinking about the company's needs. So what are their pain points? And you can do this through looking at the job description, of course, but maybe try and search some employees working in that business uh, through LinkedIn, through social platforms. They may list some of the challenges that they're working on under their job description. So you can kind of get a better feel 
for the type of person that they would look for or the type of skill sets that are important. So really do some research also as well on just the company in general. So something that I have found to be quite valuable as well is just typing in the company's name on Google and hitting the news and seeing if there's any new postings, anything exciting going on about that business as well, just to give you that insight, which is really important. And you can bring that up later on in an interview scenario. Think about the company's values um their interests their ambition and does it align with your own and again what tangible examples from your self-reflection can you pick out that are going to align to that to their values and you can typically find that out through again like the careers page sometimes they have a value section they share more about the culture you can again have a look at the employees and see if they list anything about their own values and the hiring managers what what they list so just taking some time to do that networking is a big one as well so if you can are you able to connect with individuals already working at those businesses and if you can can you just openly speak with them about what are some of the challenges that they're facing in their work what are some of the challenges you're currently facing just have like really open-ended conversations um, what do you enjoy the most about where you work the culture just really enabling you to cultivate this solid list of really constructive information that's going to help you when it comes to making this application and think about how can you fill in the gaps? So again, from the job description, if there's anything that you do have missing, how can you mitigate that risk? Especially if you're coming from academia and you're going to industry. So can you back that up with projects that you've been working on? So for example, if you're making an application to a med tech business, although you're missing that industry experience, have you worked on personal projects within the med tech space? You know, can you showcase anything you've done? Have you done any presentations, any blogs? So just start thinking about, again, how can you fill in these gaps? This is really important. And finally, culture is as important as tech. So think about, again, kind of aligning with your values, but do you feel your personality fits to what they describe as well? And, and just kind of reflect on that, looking at your notes from your self-reflection. So we've done our research, which does take time. And I do think it's important because it is quite easy to just kind of hit your CV sending everywhere without thinking about it. And at times it can always become a bit robotic, but just taking that time is really going to help you stand out. So let's talk a little bit about a cover letter. Now, some companies, they still have this as a requirement. Some don't so much, but that's why I just want to share this with you, because I think it's important that we go over it. Now, CTO that I work quite closely with shared with me that they receive hundreds of applications and recruitment is only a small percentage of their day. And they can only invest at times like 30 seconds to read a cover letter. So it's really important that applicants understand that they only have a few seconds to connect and capture their attention. Now, with that in mind, it's thinking about creating your cover letter as an elevator pitch. So let's relate back to the self-reflection exercise. This is where all of that juicy stuff is going to be really important to make a really strong story about yourself. So when I say elevator pitch, it's thinking about going into, let's say, Google, for example. You're in Google's office you're at their elevator, you wanna go from the bottom floor to the very top floor. You go into the elevator and the hiring manager for the job that you wanna apply for is in there with you up until the top floor. You have from the bottom to the top to explain to them how you can add value and how you can enrich their team. And that's how you should view your elevator pitch. So in this instance, less is more, not to be so wordy, really um, use punchy language to explain the things that you've been doing. And it should be something that is complementing your CV because you really wanna be able to tell a story about you as an individual that sometimes maybe you can't take from a CV because it's very factual. And you wanna always be thinking about 
how are you going to add value to that specific company, to that specific position? Can you get across any of your personality, your characteristics? Um, what's really important is that potentially for every job that you apply for, you might have to do a different cover letter. Again, that can seem quite exhausting, quite tiresome. However, that is going to set you apart because one cover letter for one business might not be right for another and it might just be not very aligned. So it is important to take that time to just reflect on the research that you've been doing. If anybody wants to dive deeper into cover letters as well, um, we can definitely dive into that on a one on one, but I'll touch on that at the end of the presentation. So also just talking a bit about your CV, again, tailoring and customizing, so, so important. I can't stress this enough. And it should really be an honest reflection of you, of your experiences. You want to make this personable, okay? You are not a robot, you're a human, and you want to get this across. That's really important. So don't fear to be creative, to, to maybe stand out a little bit. Can can you do something quirky on the CV, something creative? Can you throw in a quote that you really live by that you think is quite fun? Uh, and always think value. What value can you add and can you bring to this organisation? I would say avoid buzzwords and overused phrases. If you're going to do that, you want to, to back it up to demonstrate what you've actually done. Because we see also often the, the likelihood of team player, ambitious, but nothing after that. So if you're telling me you're a team player from your CV, I wanna know how you're a team player. I wanna see some facts. I wanna see some evidence on how you are. So I always say to try and limit to about two pages if you can on CV, written in the first person. You wanna have consistent formatting throughout as well and subhead subheadings, bullet points, Make sure you proofread, um, make sure it's very evidence-based and again, really highlighting the impact and the value. So if we think a little bit about the breakdown of a CV, I always would look initially at the top for like a personal profile and about me. This is providing an overview of who you are and it's outside of your cover letter. So again, the two are, are complementing one another. It's not copying and pasting. So really understanding, I guess, how you can add value to the position and to the organization. And you're gonna be able to answer this through your self-reflection and through the research you've been doing and the tangible examples that you can use to back this up. Mentioning your why. Um, so why you want to work for this organization. So um, have you, are they working on a specific mission that is really aligned to your own and resonates? Why is that? Definitely mention that, um, having that like a ta close attachment. If maybe you saw a really awesome article in the Google News search that you, you did, mention that. So it just shows that you're being more proactive in this research phase. I always say as well, listing um, your top three soft skills and using tangible examples, again, to back that up. And I think that with your personal profile, really um, maybe try and keep it to four or five bullet points. So highlighting each area, as I mentioned here, you want it to be powerful, you want it to be punchy, you want to relate, like I say, back to that self-reflection exercise. That's really important that you work to do that. And then let's talk a little bit about your employment history, because I, I know a lot of people, they struggle with this sometimes. And for me, it's avoiding being quite generic. So it's going beyond just listing your job description. Can you actually explain underneath this um, the problem that you've addressed? the action you took and the results, the value and the impact that this created in your job, in your specific position. Even if you're in academia, can you list that? Can you really make a point of that? For example, you know, this enabled us to deliver 5% improvement on this project. So you wanna be telling a story, I would say. I What I find quite nice is 
adding in your job description, adding in your employment history, sorry, is listing maybe like the top three things that you've also learned from your experience. Uh, because again, that kind of shows self-reflection. And to me, it shows you're self-aware and the things that you've learned, you're going to apply to potentially my organization. And not many people do that. I just think it's a little bit different, a nice touch. Um, again, just being specific with the technology, the things that you've been doing, particularly within data as well, being really specific with that and um, always using action verbs, things like organized, engaged, you influence. These are really important. Just I want to share. Yeah, yeah. So sorry, just two quick questions, because one is in the chat and the other one is something that I have in mind. So we go for the chat first. Um, Zimizani asked whether it's okay to add personal social media to your CV and like which pages you would add and which you wouldn't. Sure. So it depends how you manage your social media. If it's like a Twitter page that's just very personal and you're tweeting about your general life, I probably wouldn't attach that. I would maybe look at creating like a, a Twitter that's specific for data and, and just sharing knowledge and inspiration in that sense and sharing that. So it, I would say it depends on how you utilize that social media. If it is purely personal, you're sharing your life um, and, that, and that alone, I probably would steer away from that. I hope that yeah, answers the question. Yeah, I think it does. And the other one is about the metrics and the values, because I, I also have an, an academic background and coming from this academic background, entering industry, it kind of felt difficult to sell the value of the things that I did. So I just started adding like numbers to, let's say, the number of conferences, the number of publications, something like, like an output that is countable. Um, and I was just wondering, would you recommend something like that? Or is that... I mean, probably it goes in line with that, probably not. Certainly, yes. Yeah, definitely be quite specific if you can, because I do understand that coming from academia, it is really hard at times to kind of measure that. So I would be very specific with the conferences, the things that you attended during your time studying, and um, maybe even instead of the value it had on your studies, the value actually had on you. What did you learn? What were your top three things that you learned? So definitely. Cool, thanks. Brilliant point as well. Yeah, absolutely brilliant point. So um, what I wanna to talk to you a bit, little bit about as well is what we look for. Um, at me as a recruiter, for example, what are some of the things that really stand out to me? And this is outside of course of your relevant skills and your educational background, these type of things. For me, really important is hobby projects. Um, are you on GitHub, Stack Overflow, any other platforms? Are you being quite proactive in, in learning and, and trying new things? Are you involved in the community? To me, that shows that you care about giving back. Are you maybe volunteering your time? Um, that could be very transferable in my business, for example, if I was going to hire you. So how involved are you here? I'd really like to get to know your why as well. So if you're able to get that across through your cover letter and CV, like kind of underlining your values, that's always gonna be really important for me because it goes so much deeper than just being technically a good fit. There's so much more to that. There's so many layers that we need to break down when hiring. Of course, that is important, but the other areas are equally as important in, in my eyes. Are you sharing tangible examples? So again, if it's just buzzwords, um, I see that every day uh, and a lot. So I, I want more. I want evidence on how you can back that up, the things that you've been doing. Can I learn a little bit about your characteristics? Um, are you open to learning? And again, that kind of correlates to like hobby projects or if you've been doing different courses, if you've been attending conferences and events, are you mentioning that on your CV? And are you working on your personal brand? So that's certainly something I would look for. Are you doing blog posts? Are you immersed on social media? What kind of things are you talking about here? What are you doing? These are, again, gonna really help you stand out. 
So let's talk a little bit about making the job application now. This can be a little bit scary, a little bit frightening. Now, I'm a huge Harry Potter nerd, just throwing it out there. So I couldn't help but get the older Accio job in there. But what's really important is tailoring again and customizing. It's so, so important. Again, you're not a job application robot. Take the time to analyze the companies, the pain points, the values, what's important to them, reflect, how can you add value to that and provide tangible examples? Like I say, it, it is time consuming doing this for every other job, every CV you're changing, but I can promise you it will be so worth it. And it's all about just thinking short-term pain, long-term gain. The smallest of things, the smallest, smallest of changes that you make to your CV for each job, they can make the biggest difference. So that's really important. Also, could you potentially mirror the language that they use in their job spec that they use on their company with pages, LinkedIn pages that you feel align with your own? Could you maybe mirror that and mirror those words? So instantly when they're reading that, they feel, OK, that's me, actually, as a, as a person and my values. Review and ask for feedback as well. So before you even thought of sending your CV, ask your friends. Ask your family, um, ask maybe old colleagues, hey, um, this is a job I'm really interested in. I'm thinking of sending my CV here. What do you think? Like, do you have any feedback? Is there anything I should do differently? Again, like ask, ask the people that you feel can help you and add value because sometimes we can have a bit of an emotional attachment to our CV and oh, I see that this is my CV, it's so great. And, and I, I, I've got the perfect template. And um, sometimes we need to hear that feedback and it's not nice, but it's all for the right reasons. So that can really benefit. Diversification, really important. Um, the more you can send your CV out to different roles that you want to potentially work for, the better it is for you because hopefully the more feedback you'll get, um, the more it enables you to practice as well, um, potentially interview scenarios. Yeah, it also enables us to network as well. So can you connect with people who are working in the company? Um, for example, are they going to attend a show or an event? Does it show that you're interested in that as well? And um, could you even potentially get a referral in the business? So for example, if you think about some companies, they have a referral scheme, right? So if you're speaking to an individual who's working in an organization that you wanna work at, actually ask them, hey, I'm really interested in working in your business. Is there any way that you can put me in touch with somebody who's responsible for hiring? And that's going to potentially benefit them as well if there's like a referral bonus. So don't hold yourself back from doing that. Um, a big thing I would say is networking really, again, requires you to come out of your comfort zone. Um, be proactive in this. Maybe book half an hour every week to focus just on networking as well. I'd say that's really important. And finally, just be resilient. So use your failure to fuel your motivation. Always look at this process as a lesson learned. So whenever you get a rejection, yes, it, it can be disheartening and, and feel that pain, feel that emotion, but don't let it consume you. Think about, okay, how can I learn from this? Moving forward, what can I do better? How can I adjust? Uh, an example is uh, JK Rowling. So JK Rowling pitched Harry Potter to publishers 12 times and she was reje rejected 12 times. And now look at the Harry Potter franchise, right? It's, it's crazy. So just keep being resilient and really use these failures that you might come across to, to just fuel your motivation. Don't let it define you. So there's, there's just yeah. another question because I think it, it, it fits perfectly before we go to the interview preparation. Um, so there's Zimilani asks whether summer schools are also important to add them to this feed. Mm -hmm probably as something like additional training or like additional expertise or something like that. Definitely, yeah. If you feel that this is aligned to where you're heading and to your learning process, please put that in there, um, definitely. And also a nice touch is, again, could you list the top three things that you've learned in that summer school? Perfect. Uh, so let's talk a bit about interview preparation. I can just about 
talk properly again, sorry about that. I don't know what happened there, but research, this is really important. Before an interview, um, again, look at your self-reflection tasks that you've done, but also think about the company's mission. So again, what are their pain points? What's their culture, their values? Can you look at any company blogs that they have? Uh, are they on YouTube? Do they have a series themselves? Have a look at Glassdoor as well. This is really good. It gives you like an insight into the companies and who they are. And again, can you network? Can you potentially reach out to anyone who's working in that business and actually say, hey, I actually have an interview of your company next week. I, I really am excited about what you're doing because of X, Y, Z. I just wondered, like, what were some of the challenges that you're working on? It really love to get an insight before I go into that conversation. Um, and you'll be surprised that you may not hear back from people every single time that you send these messages because people obviously are also very busy. They can get quite consumed with a lot of messages through social medias. So um, don't be disheartened if you don't hear back, but you may. And if you do hear back from that one person, that could be the difference from you going into an interview and having all of that brilliant information that you need to excel and to bring that up. Even in an interview, you could say, actually, I, I had a really brief conversation with one of your engineers and they mentioned X, Y, Z. And that really resonated with me because I'm really passionate about this. I've been working on personal projects with this. So again, it's going to give you great talking points for the interview scenario. And just take some time to think, why do you actually want this job? And tailor your answers to that. Tailor your answers. That's really important. Do not fear the why, I always say. So ask questions. Uh, Interaction is really key. Being engaging. Asking why. Why are you doing things in this way? I'd really love to, to learn more about that. Of course, it's the way you deliver that why is really important, that you're doing it in a good way, a genuine way, a curious way, and not just a really direct and judgmental way. So don't fear that why. And don't get hung up on what you can't do. You have that knowledge from your self-awareness, the areas that you're working on, but actually be confident on your abilities, on your achievements so far, on what you've been doing, because you're an incredible person and you deserve that interview. Um, so own it and just don't focus on the things that you can't do. Have that self-belief. When it comes to the interview scenario, I, I always actually recommend trying to get as much information as you can with five different areas. So for me, it's learning more about the company, the position, the technologies and the tools, how they work with data, um, the team, the culture and education. So your learning possibilities. So you wanna be able to link your questions to your motivations. So for example, earlier we spoke about my passion for studying in my free time. What kind of employee education programs do you offer? How involved is the team in the community? I'm just sharing some questions with you um, and just gonna give you some time to go through these. I won't read them out, or maybe if you wanna screenshot this or take a photo, but I highly recommend that you look to do that. I'll just give you a few more minutes to have a look through that. Just a quick follow up questions, uh, yeah. question to the questions. So this sure. is plural and singular there. Um, because I was wondering, like, I mean, like diversity, it's everywhere. And like, it feels like each company wants to be diverse, wants to promote like this kind of equality and all these things. But like, and I, I think like lots of these questions kind of tackle whether the company really values these things, for instance. But I was wondering if there are any kind of red flags that you would say like okay this is like a no-go this is like the company probably doesn't i mean uh, probably it's a hard question i see that now but probably there's something that like on the top of your mind that you would say like okay this is a red flag don't go for that company it's definitely not like yeah. valuing it as much as they say sure so it's very much about their walking the, the walk, not just talking the talk when it comes to diversity, right? So the things that I would say are red flags is if 
you see them sharing information about how they value diversity. But when you have the interview, you can see it's very much a bro culture. And actually, there isn't any diversity in the business. And the, the views and the mindset on that isn't what you had hoped or isn't what you feel had been articulated through the literature that they have on their company page. So it's actually going to an interview and asking them questions as well around how do you value inclusion in your organization? Are there any internal employee resource groups that you have to support diverse minorities? What external work do you do to support nonprofit organizations or communities that really look to encourage more diversity or more inclusive cultures? Um, how are you working to build an equitable environment? Can you share some challenges that you've had recently when it comes to building inclusion and how did you overcome that? What were the solutions that you had in place? So I would say it's asking questions like this and don't shy away from that. Don't be afraid to ask them these questions because it is really important that you get to the core of what their values are because it's very easy to, on a website, say you value diversity. Um, but I have seen the challenge that many people face of, seeing that and then when they join a business it's not what they had hoped for so by asking these questions it's going to really help you get that gut feeling in yourself if if you feel that this is a mission they're genuinely working on and tying it into you providing tangible examples of the things that you've been doing actually ask them like I, i'd love to learn more about some of the examples where you have seen your diverse team impact the success of the business or what have been some real highlights for you. So asking them, almost interviewing them in that sense. I hope that answers your question. Excellent, thanks, that helps a lot. Excellent. So I just wanna talk a little bit as well <clears throat> about the salary negotiation because this is a big challenge that I see many people face. Uh, and again, and it comes with that like, at times self-doubt and not having that belief and almost being afraid to ask for what we feel and know we deserve um, that because potentially the offer might get retracted or they might think that we're not right because we're asking for what we deserve. And I wanna break that down. Um, when it comes to salary negotiation, really take the time to have that mindset shift. So practice, preparation, and strategies. These are three things that are really important. So when I say preparation, it's taking research, speaking to people in your industry or, or like your friends in this industry, knowing what real looks like at your level. So actually just saying, hey, how comfortable are you to just openly speak about salaries it's something that I'm really struggling with I'm not really too sure what to expect if if you're going into industry and I just really appreciate some support so just being again really quite open really quite genuine um, and asking people that you feel can can help you and support you because we want everybody around us to to flourish right and to thrive and to be supportive even join communities. There are some great communities online, like Women in Negotiation. That's a really great community where you can learn a lot about kind of how to negotiate the tools you need to be successful in this space. And also there's a lot of like-minded individuals there who are going through similar challenges to you. So again, asking them questions. It's all about believing in your strengths and your ability and your potential and just having the confidence and clarity to ask for what you deserve. And this ties in again to your self-reflection task to speak into your friends, your colleagues, your family who are reinforcing that you do deserve this and you've worked your ass off for this and you can flourish in this space. And always look at the bigger picture. So for me, of course, compensation is really important, um, but it's not just financial. It's also about your personal growth and your development. Don't think of like the next few months when it comes to like the salary. Think of the next few years. I've seen some people make the mistake of having two offers and taking the offer that has the highest salary. And um, unfortunately, they're not necessarily learning as much as they could have in the other offer where the salary was still good and um, 
you don't want to fall behind you know it's always evolving data and technology right it's always changing you want to be in an environment where you're always learning and you're always supported in learning and you feel encouraged and you feel you have an amplified voice and you can really make a difference these things are going to add so much more value to you in the long term in you as an individual working in the data space than a really high salary which can only last for so long i also um, have a blog post which are tips from women in tech on salary negotiations so i can share that with you after and i really recommend reading that as well it's just some words of encouragement from other women working in tech on how to approach that and how to go about that. So just some advice here from a development manager when it comes to salary negotiations and, and just asking for your worth. It's really crucial to know your worth and to become comfortable communicating your worth. In interviews, in negotiations, what she recommends is sitting back and listening to what you're being offered and then come with a counter offer, but referring to your skills, your level of experience, your recent achievements, again, tying it in with tangible examples, your counter offer should be based on your idea of the optimal life, whether it is working hours, location, salary, or other benefits, everything is negotiable. Never simply accept an offer, offer to accept. And there's some more really great advice on the blog post. So I'll be sure to share that with you. But it's been such a pleasure sharing. Thanks for bearing with me. And um, any questions, please feel free to fire them my way. I'd love to get connected with all of you. So feel free to hit me up on LinkedIn um, to get involved in the Equal Inspired podcast. Would love to hear your stories. 